so one of the benefits of having uh, today's workshop um, here with Tim is that we have done uh, two soil tests so far and we're doing a third one um, either today or over the next couple of days which will give us um, some data to work on between the different uh, the different pasture systems that Tim's got growing here. So we've taken one uh, sample in summer active pasture, so when it was still warm I think back in February. Uh, we took one um, over the last couple of weeks in uh, the control um, paddock and um, one that we're going to take in the next week or so uh, which is going to be winter active grasses. So we're hoping to get some variation in the different data that we're getting back to show whether there's any difference between those different systems. Um, so the summer active, we, oh, we were going to sample at the end of Feb, but we started sampling it in the, the beginning of March. Um, <clears throat> we tried to do each one about two weeks um, after irrigation so that we've got the same moisture level so that we're not just looking at um, mineralisation of nutrients based on the moisture level in, in the soil. So we sampled the summer active um, while it was still warm, two weeks after irrigation. Uh, it is a brown clay loam, it's probably more clay than it is loam, but uh, that's the actual technical classification of it. Uh, it does have a very, very high cation exchange capacity. Obviously, most of the clays around here do, uh, compared to, say, sandier soils down towards um, Bendigo and then granites uh, um, around the ranges towards Melbourne. So um, we're probably in the heaviest part of the landscape here, apart from uh, up in the Riverina area. So uh, we are constantly going to be struggling with um, magnesium excesses, most of us. Uh, and um, calcium deficiency in that regard. <clears throat> and uh, nitrogen's a big problem here. There's not a lot of uh, soluble nitrogen for plant growth, and there's not a lot of ammonium nitrogen either. So uh, both low on that regard. Sodium quite high, above 300 parts per million, so that's gonna be impacting uh, our biological populations. Phosphorus is uh, obviously a main nutrient for growth of leaves and um, roots and biomass. So with very, very low phosphorus, we're not gonna be getting uh, that growth pattern. The tad stock on it. Um, so as they're pooping that material out and it's going onto the soil surface, um, if we haven't got a very active biological system, which we've got lots of active bacteria and that can be linked to the, the manure depositions there, um, but we haven't got a lot of fungal activity and so we'll have a look at that and connect that to, to um, the biological results on the next page. Um, but in terms of actual nutrient availability, it's perhaps not converting into that due to the gap in the middle of the biological pyramid, which is that protozoa and nematode level that's going to convert the, the bacteria into um, plant available nitrogen and phosphorus, things like that. So uh, potassium, when we talk about toxicities here uh, that aggravate each other, um, all these ones in the toxicity column um, work together in aggravating each other. So um, iron, manganese and uh, potassium, usually if you've got high potassium, you usually have high manganese and high iron. They work all, all together with each other and um, magnesium and, and sodium can often be high together as well. So these ones are all working um, against us in terms of balancing out uh, these nutrients on the left, which we've got deficiencies of. So if we go back to, to the deficiencies column, we look at boron and zinc. Um, boron and calcium have a, a, a synergistic relationship there where boron is um, going to help make the calcium more available. And so we've got low boron and low calcium, so we've got a double whammy effect there. And we've also got low zinc. Um, I think it's extremely low, just from memory. Um, I don't have the actual nutrient one in there. Uh, the low zinc is going to be affecting our um, early germination, our early growth. So uh, I think one of the things that Tim told me when I first came here before I any, did any soil testing was that um, he found it hard to uh, get his um, native grass crops go, you know, um, starting off. So one of those key nutrients that's involved in that is zinc in activating germination and getting um, the hormones in the plant to stimulate uh, rapid growth during that initial phase of the plant growth. Um, so if we compare that to the control pasture, we've got similar issues in that we've got calcium deficiency, magnesium toxicity, we've got low nitrogen, high sodium, um, not as much as the summer active um, pasture, but still very much too high. 
Uh, we've got low zinc again, so <coughs> contributing to, to um, early vigour and growth, and we've got high potassium and high iron. So uh, very much the similar sorts of um, problems. So one of the things that we could focus on with these two paddocks and possibly the third one's going to be very similar. Uh, so if we can bring the calcium up, it can hopefully balance out some of these. It's not going to get rid of them. It's just going to hopefully balance them into a position where uh, we can uh, minimise the effects of some of these. So the sodium, as we looked at before in the previous segment before we had lunch, the effects of, of high sodium aren't something that we can counteract immediately. Uh, we can try and apply humic acids and fulvic acids, either commercially or we can um, extract them in our compost tea as we've done today. It's going to be naturally high in uh, humic and fulvic acids that are made by the biology in the compost. Uh, and we're going to try and buffer that sodium effect and also stimulate the biology to start to grow. But whether or not it will continue to grow in an environment with that amount of salt load, we have to tell over time. Um, Potassium, I can't remember whether it was exceedingly high. We'll probably get to get a final uh, lot of results put out to you guys as well once we've done the, the final soil test. Um, but today we're concentrating on the biology uh, and the iron. Iron's typically high around here as well. So um, not a lot that we can see is maybe, you know, been from directly from management practices, I don't think. So it's not um, fertilizers that you've put out, Tim? None. None, yeah. Uh, okay, so if we have a look at the, this is a typical biological test that you would get back if you, if you do a biological sample. So giving us all the information, or most of the information that we need to make decisions about our compost and compost tea. Uh, so this is for the bluegrass paddock, which is our summer active. Uh, so if we have a look at the main, um, the main things here is we've got uh, very high active bacteria, so well above range. Our total bacteria is also quite high above range, which is good because we're getting that bottom of the pyramid happening. We're getting lots of activity. Uh, active fungal is in range. That's, that's also a good thing, but it's not including mycorrhizal fungi. That's a separate um, reading. So just keeping in mind the active fungi is quite good um, and total fungi is quite good as well. So we've got good active fungi and active bacteria there. Uh, when we look at hyphal diameter, this is talking about the width of the uh, fungal networks that are out there. So when you look at it in, underneath the microscope, you can get an estimation <coughs> on the size of these fungal networks as to whether they're uh, quite large or, or quite um, fine and small. So this one's an average of uh, three micrometers. So it's quite, quite a, a good average to have. Um, there is some conjecture over whether the, it was previously thought that the hyphal diameter, if it's over three, it's more likely to be a beneficial fungi than um, pathogenic fungi. But uh, there's now evidence to suggest that that's not exactly the case. So um, we're still trying to aim for larger hyphal networks, but obviously whether or not they're pathogenic species or beneficial species will tell with our ongoing monitoring in the in the paddocks. So just bear that in mind. Uh, if we look at protozoa and nematodes, which are on our, our middle of our uh, feeding pyramid, when we remember back to our feeding pyramid, uh, the protozoa numbers are all quite low. So we can see that quite simply, 311, 311 out of 5,000. And uh, ciliates are, um, are low as well. So all these guys are doing the conversion of that uh, the active bacteria and the nutrients that they are giving off. So if we have a look down here at the plant available nitrogen supply, which is an indication um, derived from the, this protozoa activity, it's quite low. So we'd like to see that up to you know 54 to 80 kilos um, to the hectare, which does happen in some cases, um, or even higher than that. Uh, but in this case, we've really got not much activity happening here. We've got not much uh, nematode activity happening either. If we have a, if we have a look at our uh, species that we've got listed over here, we've got a few bacterial feeders, which is expected because we've got quite a good active bacterial population. Uh, we've got just a few fungal feeders. And then we've got about five or six uh, fungal and root feeding nematodes. 
So these guys are going to be consuming the active fungi that we've got and the active bacteria and also going to be eating our roots and causing problems there. Because we've got virtually no mycorrhizal colonisation happening here, we've only got 11% endomycorrhizal populations, which is the ones that we would like to have a lot of. Um, we'd like to see 80% there or higher. Um, this is leaving ourselves open to a, a gap where these guys can, can come in and capitalise on that and also the bacteria too. We haven't got any um, really predatory fungi happening here, keeping those, those in um, check. So just something to think about. Uh, and then if we look down here, the uh, biomass ratios, these ones aren't really going to be in, uh, in the right ratios unless these top ones are going to be in there in range um, because it depends on these. So we're looking at uh, putting active fungi to active bacterial and total fungi to total, total bacterial. So in the sort of pasture situation that um, Tim's trying to create, with a uh, native slash improved pasture. Um, we're looking at uh, trying to create um, about a one to one ratio. So if we look down here um, with our active fungal to active bacterial, um, we're, we're only about half. So we're not quite there yet. So we need to be building um, more active fungi to balance that active bacteria because at the moment we've got too much bacteria and not enough fungi in that sort of system. So uh, these are some of the microscope shots from those samples that I took. When I took the samples and uh, these samples have been sent off to Soil Food Web to be analysed under their microscopes because they have a lot uh, better laboratory than I do. I just have the one microscope that I use to, to do all my samples. Um, they have a lot uh, better powered microscopes and better lenses than I do. So I send them off to Soil Food Web for their analysis and then I also keep a little sample and have a look um, under the microscope at home as well so I can be getting a sense of what's happening uh, and I've taken a couple of samples from different sites. It just allows me to take a few more samples within the bay to see whether or not it correlates with what the Soil Food Web reports are telling us. So um, in these shots uh, there wasn't a lot of active fungi although it's coming up on the Soil Food Web one that there was more than I could see in, in my microscope sample. Um, we've got quite a, a lot of um, organic matter clusters and bacteria on, the, on those uh, soil particles uh, which can be clouded by the humic acid which is the brown stuff so sometimes when you're looking through the microscope and uh, focusing through the sample uh, you can't often see everything that's there because it's in layers that's sort of stacked on top of each other so it takes a while to to get through all those um, layers and see different things but we've got a bit of a, a residue here of uh, a, a nematode it looks like um, and we had bits of not ones that I included in here, but bits of um, microarthropod legs and things like that and little antennae and things off little bugs that were floating around in the sample as well. So it indicates that they're active there. Um, and on this one we had a bit of a root, a bit of root material through there um, that was being digested by bacteria and organic matter um, clinging to that as well. As we remember from the previous nutrient slide, we talked about the, the similar deficiencies that are in the bluegrass paddock. So, um, we've got, again, low calcium, uh, high magnesium, high sodium, uh, high iron as well. Just to go back to the calcium side of it as well, something I was thinking of during the lunch break, which I haven't mentioned, but um, oftentimes uh, when we've got lots of really uh, nice active uh, fungal populations and also mycorrhizal fungi, they're capable of um, holding on to more calcium in the soil and concentrating it around the root zone. So if we're trying to increase calcium uh, in, our, in our nutrient testing or around our available calcium, it's going to be around our root, our root hairs. Um, by bringing these fungal levels up, we're going to be helping do that anyway because it's going to be concentrating it around the root zone where it, it isn't at the moment because we've only got 8%. So if we can increase that, we're going to increase our, our calcium to our plant. Now, we haven't done any in-crop testing on these grasses, but another thing that Tim could do throughout the seasons is take some leaf samples and send that off to see how that correlates to the soil testing that we've done to see whether there's any gaps there, to see whether if we put out fungi over periods of time to see that the plant is actually gaining more 
uh, plant available calcium as a result of having those fungal networks on the root zone. So again, just to, just to jump through here, um, we've got a lot more uh, variety of our nematodes in this sample than we did in the last one. Um, but again, we haven't got very many numbers. We've only got 1.76 of a nematode. Uh, that's per, per gram. So it's all calculated um, when you do a, a microscope slide. You take a, a portion of the soil sample in the water and then agitate it and then you're actually looking at the water. So you're not um, taking a slice of soil or anything like that. So uh, for Soil Food Web, they work out what it is on a per uh, grams per litre, a milliliter basis or numbers per milliliter or numbers per gram um, so that it's standardised over each soil test that you take so that you can compare it year to year. So um, yeah, still got all the, the fungal and root feeders there uh, and got a lot more bacterial feeders here even though we've probably got less active bacteria. So we may have captured it at a time where um, you know there was more variety of nematodes in there, um, but perhaps, uh, well, we know less active bacteria. But again, um, the total bacteria range, I think, is similar to the last one. Uh, active fungi uh, in range, but still a bit low, could be a bit better. And our total fungi is below range. So we want to increase um, our active and our total fungi here to balance out those ratios that we talked about in the previous slide. And uh, we... Um, would also like to increase our hyphal diameter because it's even though you know um, we're not exactly not everyone's exactly agreeing on the hyphal diameter being above three but uh, in general I think it's a good idea um, so then we have a look at our mycorrhizal colonization here we've, we've got zero ectomycorrhizal colonization and only eight percent endomycorrhizae so again similar to the last one I think the last one was ten percent no, eleven percent um, so the summer actives have, have got a little bit more mycorrhizal colonisation, so whether or not that, we, that comes out in the winter active grasses, we, we won't know until we do this last soil test. Uh, and again, the protozoa numbers are quite low, so um, conversion of plant available nitrogen and other nutrients is going to be low. So, and as a result, our ratios are all low as well. So we need to, we need to fix up these individual groups as well as focusing it on it as a oh, as a whole and trying to get as much diversity in that samples as we possibly can. So at the moment probably the best thing that we can say about our samples is that they've got good active bacteria <laughs> and um, <coughs> there's some ne nematode evidence of nematodes there. So we want to increase fungi and we want to increase protozoa and that's going to improve our nutrient conversion here. Uh, and the microscope shots from the second one we've got um, pretty much nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> this is just uh, bits of um, mineral particles, probably a bit of bacteria and a little bit of organic matter clusters. On this one we've got um, a bit of uh, fungi here um, with uh, organic matter clusters and I think there was a root behind there, just from memory. There's a, a bit of root material through the back there that you can't exactly see but you could see it on the microscope when you slide up and down. Um, but in a really good soil sample underneath the microscope, it would be so covered in fungal networks and have nematodes swimming through it and protozoa moving through it and lots of bacteria and you can really see the difference. It's hard to show with just photos of it. Um, it's the real proof in the pudding is when we actually look at it in live real time. If we're going to be soil testing, uh, we want to develop a basic starting point where we can work from in terms of developing a plan that's going to actually make a difference. So we want to get some nutrient testing done, preferably pick uh, a paddock that's maybe a bit um, poor performance or you've got issues in it, weed issues or, or livestock issues, whichever, you know, pick a paddock and decide, okay, that, that's one I'm going to test. Um, preferably do an, a nutrient analysis and a biological analysis. Once we've got the information from those soil tests, then that's going to inform um, what our farm management plans are going to look like and what our paddock plans, what our plans for that paddock might be. So if we originally plan to sow something in there that's then we decide <laughs> is not suitable, um, well, at least we've got the information, then we can, we can either uh, ameliorate that to make it suitable, or if it's not possible for that season, we might be able to um, you know, limit our expectations slightly <laughs> in accordance with what our soil, soil tests and um, observations in the paddock are telling us. Uh, so the main thing that we want to get out of this soil testing is to identify nutrient deficiencies and toxicity so that we can target um, certain nutrients and sorry, certain nutrients and imbalances. 
and to inform our fertiliser choices if we're making choices about what we're going to put on. Hopefully we're not going to be putting on stuff that we don't need uh, and making our situation worse. And for today, or for, for this um, project, we've been doing it for, for scientific purposes to, to do testing. Uh, and that's mostly what I do, is to try and quantify it to show people um, you know, how, how it's working on our place. So uh, we're not always just doing it for um, the purpose of, of uh, developing a farm plan for the season. So when you're choosing to do soil testing, I do recommend that you do nutrient and biological testing. If you've done nutrient testing before and you've got you know, a good history of soil tests from say the last couple of years and you've never done a biological test, then I would suggest to get one of those done. Um, and if you have been doing nutrient testing, just check uh, either by sending it to me or, or ringing me up or whatever. Just see if you've been getting all the information out of it that you can because some, uh, some people who do the nutrient testing um, only give you selective parts of the results and so you won't get necessarily all the uh, major trace elements, uh, major nutrients and um, trace elements that you need out of that soil test. Uh, and I won't mention names but there's yeah, some companies that only pick like about seven or eight nutrients to test and that's all you'll get back. So it's not very helpful if you're trying to develop an overall a holistic plan because you're not getting a lot of information out of it. The other thing you want to distinguish between is available nutrients, so what's soluble in that portion of soil that you sent off, um, exchangeable nutrients, so things that are going to change um, over time depending on, uh, without getting too scientific, but depending on um, the mineralisation and solubility of different nutrients and how they react with um, the clay particles that are in that soil, and also total measurements, so that's uh, insoluble portions that we're not necessarily going to access this season but that we might be aiming to solubilize with a biological um, program. So just be careful when you get um, uh, soil test results back that you're comparing apples with apples. So if you've got a previous season soil test results that are um, reported in different measurements, you might have some reported in milligrams per kilo, some in parts per million, percentages, um, micrograms, uh, you might have it reported in kilos to the hectare, so you ideally want to be um, converting it into one, uh, you know, one, um, what's the word, one result that you can compare through all the different nutrients so that you're comparing apples with apples basically. And everyone knows that milligrams per kilo is the same as parts per million? Oh, okay. Oh, now we do. <laughs> Optional extras on your soil test um, might be things like molybdenum, cobalt and selenium, which are um, typically things you would test for if you're running livestock. Um, I always just recommend to test for it anyway. Uh, um, and with the uh, environmental analysis labs that I use to do the soil testing, uh, they used to test for these in available forms, but they've since found out that um, the, the testing just isn't um, giving conclusive enough data so they only now test in total forms. So uh, they've taken the active, um, they used to have an optional extra for active molybdenum, cobalt and selenium, they've taken that off now so you just get it as part of your standard um, soil test results in terms of total nutrients. Um, silica is one that doesn't often get tested on, on other soil test companies. I know EAL does it so that's why I go with them. Um, but not necessarily a nutrient, but it can still be used by the plant to, um, to boost the, the cell strength uh, and can work really well in conjunction with calcium. Now, um, I've done some specific testing for people, organic farmers who've been in conversion before um, or been going through that conversion process or just starting out. And so um, if you're ever wanting to go through that process, you can get specific testing done for organochloride, chlorines and um, phosphates. So it's if you're looking at, at converting a place into um, you know, a biological system that's maybe looking for certification in a couple of years and something like that is, is just valuable to see what's hanging around. Um, but in a biological system where we're trying to get everything active, hopefully getting more turnover of those organochlorines and organophosphates. Um, but again, depends on the previous history. If you've just bought a place and you don't know the history of it, it can be sometimes valuable 
to do that sort of testing. And the same with, uh, with heavy metals, depending if uh, there's been any fertilizer applications go out, particularly if you have a farm that's, um, you know, maybe you've taken on recently that's um, maybe hasn't had any fertilizer applications for a while, but maybe you've had things born up back in the 60s and the 70s when perhaps uh, guidelines weren't so stringent as they are now. Um, so if you're ever suspicious of that sort of stuff, you can get specific um, uh, heavy metal testing or you can just go for specific chemical testing. So in some cases where I've been working with organic farmers, they're looking at testing for sp specific products that might have been sprayed that may have affected outside rows of um, horticulture or if they're in a buffer zone and they're just wondering how far those chemicals have come across, whether it's affected their, their paddocks. Um, you can do that. That is out there available as well. And totals may be optional in some cases. So just clarify with whoever you're getting your soil testing done whether or not they're giving you total nutrient stores because it's quite important information to have in a biological system.